Welcome, everyone. We have a, another guest today. Um, here it's really sunny, and I can't believe it's already almost the end of September. can't believe this year has gone by so fast. What do you think of that, Carl? Very fast. It seems to get faster as you get older. <laughs> exactly. Time speeds well, up. So as you notice by his name, his name is Carl Eland? That's right, yeah. That's right. That's the right got it correct. No. Yeah, a lot of people say Ellen, but you've got it right. Ellen? Yeah. I think if it was Ellen, it would be E L L A N D. That's that's correct, yeah, yeah. So Eland, I figured it out. Yay, got his name right. Well, this gentleman, Mr. Eland, is a truly gifted songwriter who writes timeless storytelling songs. I like to hear about that. And he has that rare ability to perfectly blend sing-along anthems that get your heart pounding. And alongside slower folk storytelling tracks, perfect for quiet, contemplating listening, he writes about songs about love, friendship, broken dreams, hope, restlessness. And I'm looking forward to asking him what he thinks. And I've actually spoken to many musicians about what he thinks of love songs. So... Mr. Elon, can you go back to the beginning of where you grew up, your family life, and the first time you said to yourself, music is what I want to do? Yeah, I grew up in the north of England in a place called Preston, which is uh, in the county of Lancashire. Um, and I think that when I was younger, my mum particularly used to listen to a lot of American music. So um, songwriters like Bob Dylan and... Uh, she was into um, Cat Stevens as well, although he's British. Um, and she liked John Denver, the country western singer, um, uh, John Bias, and people like that, and Neil Diamond. Nice. She was a Neil Diamond. So I always grew up um, around American music because she was sort of obsessed with it. And I always liked the uh, the storytelling nature of, of of songwriters like that. So as I got older and I got into my sort of <clears throat> teenage years and that, I got into American music. So I like people like Tom Petty, Bruce Springsteen, uh, U2, who are Irish, but kind of American-ish. Um, and so that was sort of my preference then. And and that went on to liking people like Steve Earle and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just American type songwriters and country country music as well, a little bit, not massively country, but a little bit more country rock um, influenced. And then from there, I sort of, um, I started going to open mic nights in my local town. And that's when I, uh, it took me a while before I actually got up and, and had a go, but eventually I got up and I remember the first song I ever played was No Retreat, No Surrender by Springsteen. So I just played <laughs> acoustic version of that and uh and then i started getting up every week and then eventually i started you start thinking to sell well i could write my own songs really um if i if i sort of have a look at the way they're all doing it and try and deconstruct it and try and come up with my own way of doing it so then i started playing my own songs and then that eventually led to being in a few bands before i went solo and then i started venturing out into manchester and liverpool which are my neighboring uh counties and um, Preston where I live is sort of in the middle of you know Manchester and Liverpool which have got a big music reputation and then I went to London for a while and then I played there and I started then playing acoustic really mainly and then I eventually ended up going to Nashville um, for, for a whole summer uh, a few years mm -hmm. ago which was just fantastic and um, and then I came on from there after being in Nashville and looking at them guys and thinking they're, they're, they're pretty good, these guys, actually. <laughs> that was a bit of a shock. And um, so then I came back and decided I wanted to get my music down uh, and record it. And that's what I've been doing ever since that, really. So I've, uh, I've spent a little bit of money, got a home recording studio and uh, started recording. And the, and the infrastructure's there now to put it on Spotify and Apple, you know, for, for independent artists, which is great, you know, so... Yeah, you were mentioning about acoustic. Now, what type of guitar do you have? I have a, um, I, I, I kind of favor Epiphones and Gibsons. So I like, um, I, I, I haven't quite got a proper Gibson Hummingbird, but I've got something sort of an Epiphone version of that. 
Um, I've tried all guitars. I've tried Martins, uh, Taylors, but I tend to like Gibsons for some reason. I don't know what it is. Everybody's different. I didn't like Martins and everybody loves them. But So, yeah, big shout oh. out for <laughs> What about yeah. yourself? Well, I'm a singer, so I call myself a vocalist, but I used to call myself a tenor for years. Right. And then I heard a few great tenors, and I'm like, I don't sound nearly as good as that. So I'm just a vocalist, but I do yeah. sing Italian. I do sing French and German songs. Um, cool. And then I guess in August of 2021, I took a course on effective communications and because we were amidst the pandemic yeah um i was thinking when are we going to be able to use that because you have to be you know six feet social distanced and you can't really be in a room with the same person except masks with a mask on it's hardly can hear anybody so yeah. i decided to start a podcast and over 130 episodes later and two years later still going strong yeah and then we have a fine musician such as yourself on now talking about music, which we love. Um, so you started young and why did, was it the guitar that you picked out? Why not the piano or the trumpet? I think that it's probably just because of the music that I was listening to was guitar driven and I particularly like songwriters and, um, I like the acoustic guitar and the electric guitar and the piano always seemed a bit a bit hard to learn for me um, but I do love the piano now it's a fantastic instrument and I love the sound of it um, but yeah I think I chose the guitar probably because the people who I was listening to were mainly guitar focused bands if you like so yeah and especially when you mentioned Tom Petty I realized yeah he was such a great bass is a great guitarist and also you mentioned the gibson as well I'm, i know about the gibson the stratocaster i know about the taylor i know about all these guitars i remember we have a a music shop down here called long and mcquades and uh they have a whole wall of basses right. and i'm looking at it and i'm thinking that the most expensive bass is like eight thousand dollars and the most cheapest bass is a five hundred dollar. I'm like, well, what's the difference in sound? Just because you fork over ten thousand dollars for a bass or a guitar, it doesn't mean that the sound's going to be ten thousand dollars, is it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, originally, the cheaper guitars were made of plywood, and the expensive guitars were made of solid wood. But over time, now even the cheap ones are now made of solid. They sort of dropped the whole plywood thing. Whether there's a difference, well they play better they're easier to play i would say but with all today's technology and everything and all the you know the plugins you can buy and everything i would say you could probably get away with using a cheap guitar now and well i shouldn't say that i suppose but i don't know if you'd be able to tell the difference between a, a 500 pound fender or a twenty thousand pound fender it's, it's the player really at the end of the day isn't it it's the guy playing the guitar you see these fantastic guitarists who pick up a really cheap guitar and they make it sound fantastic. So, Yeah, I was uh, talking to another musician when I asked him, could you tell in the sound quality the, how expensive the guitar was? He says maybe if it was a Gibson, he could determine the sound a Gibson makes. But with me, I mean... Right now, I'm at the point where if you just play a little bit of classical music, I'd probably know exactly what piece it is. Yeah. But some stump me. So I guess if I knew someone was playing a Taylor and that's yeah. their go-to guitar, and then one day they start playing a Taylor or Stratocaster, I wouldn't know unless they said, today, everyone, I'll be playing a different make of guitar, you know? I'm not going to say, oh, that is why it sounded so different. You know, I couldn't tell that. But I know that no. there's a guy by the name of Rick Beato. He's actually a YouTube channel, and he actually teaches you how to tell the difference in different music, what yeah. is and what isn't. And obviously, you've heard of amusia, which is uh, the medical term for tone deafness. Right. So, um, but that's great that you took up the bass. And you like Tom Petty. I love Tom Petty. Well, when he was around, but I love his music. Um, 
So what is it about music that you feel so passionate about, Carl? Um, I would say the lyrics, again, going back to the same notion of storytelling. I always wanted to write music that uh, could touch people in the same way that music touched me and had such a profound effect on the early part of my life. I think when everybody else was trying to learn really fast solos and I was always thinking, yeah, but what about the song? How do they write songs like that? You know, how do they write those lyrics that just really touch you? And um, that was always my focus. So my passion was always about the songwriting. And then I figured I'd just work the other stuff out later on. <laughs> do, do you have a favorite and least favorite part about being a musician? I would say at the moment, the biggest challenge that musicians have is probably the marketing. The marketing of, I mean, I think Spotify and Apple, it's been a great lever, leveler in the fact that everybody now has the same chance, but you mm. also put in with everything that's ever been written. So in a way, it's it's like a double-edged sword, if you like. You, you're competing with all the greats as well, and you, you when you're trying to compete for the attention of people, that can be quite difficult, but it's fantastic that everybody gets the chance to to record uh, and sing and can do it and can afford it now without a record label money. I mean, that's that's a you know that's the brilliant stage that we're at in music. I would say. Well, your song "Our Town," um, I'm like, how do you know that you play the guitar well? I'm. Do you know if anybody hears you to? here's you playing do you think they could tell how long you've been playing for um probably yeah i would say that there's a big difference between recording it as an independent artist on your own and and being in a top studio in nashville with 10 brilliant session guitar players or 10 you know musicians I mean, but that's the dream, and you've got to sort of start somewhere, aren't you? And then you can you can put your music out there, and then if if any if that ever came about, and you had the opportunity to record them proper, then I would probably take it. You know, um, can anybody tell the difference? Probably, yeah. I think what well, you know, if you're trying to attract the attention of a publisher or a record label, they're getting a, an idea of what you can do, if you like. And then they think what they could do with it. So do you think a record producer would say, okay, Carl, play the guitar for us. We want to see how good you are. Okay, so on that. And, but, and then they do this and say, okay, take the guitar, put it behind you and start playing. Are you able to do that? No, probably not. <laughs> probably not. Pass. No, not yet. <laughs> not yet, no. No. no so, I, uh... hmm. Yes, I don't. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was asked. I uh, I probably play basic guitar in order to um, get my songs out there, if you like. Um, but I would perhaps like to work with a really great guitarist in the future. I think. I think I would determine myself more as a songwriter. I mean, I can put the songs together, but I would like probably to work with someone in the future. A really good guitarist you know that's interesting you should say that who would you like to collaborate with um in the in in the in the uh the current music industry you mean my sure. ideal guitarist sure. would be the edge probably <laughs> the edge oh from yeah YouTube. yeah wow so if he's yeah. listening yeah just give me a shout <laughs> the guy from you too wow that's that's high hopes that's the guitar sound i like the most really you like the yeah, edges playing yeah huh? I, I rate him yeah above above everybody really um personally speaking i think he um he's unique he doesn't play the guitar like anybody else he he, he took a like a fork picking strumming style and, well, and rocked it up i know it might be a controversial thing to say but he's my favorite guitarist yeah well, you might say that nobody ever plays as well as The Edge does, but I'll tell you one thing. I know if you go to YouTube and you type in Charles Berthold, he can play right. anything. Fantastic right. guitar player. Another one is called Davy 502. No, sorry, Vi Davy 504, I think it is. 
Right. So, and Melissa Alftemer, actually, from Courtney Love's uh, band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she's a really good uh, guitarist. But, you know, everyone has their favorites. And mine is Susanna Hoffs from the Bengals. And okay. yours is Tom Petty. But I like Tom Petty. So it's not like you play better than them. You play better than them. I'm like, if, if you play in front of me, I'm like, this is great. Because I don't know how to play it. Yeah. Um, and also... You should check out Ellen plays bass because she's on 11 years old and she's been playing the bass since she was nine. So right. they get younger and younger. So, yeah. um, but that's interesting. So, do you have a favorite venue that you love to play in? I play the the best venue I think I've ever played in is uh, I played the Bluebird in Nashville. You know, the little Bluebird Cafe it was featured a lot on the Nashville um, TV show. But yeah, I played in there and that was just brilliant sound, brilliant acoustics. Everybody listened to everybody, every, every songwriter that went went on. And um, they were just really nice in there. Pe people in Nashville were nice as a whole. And um, yeah, I, I loved playing in there. I played three times in there when I was in Nashville. And I think that that was my favourite. I've also played at the Cavern in, in Liverpool where the Beatles started out played there a couple of times that's that's a good venue as well so and i also played uh, a venue in london which was the first venue that bob dylan ever played in in england wow uh, that was called the uh, the troubadour not the famous la troubadour um the one in london and that was a good venue as well so i like places where people listen and you can you know you can tell a little bit about the song before you play it and then you can you know and the acoustics are good and it makes for a nice night, I think, when you get a, a good selection of songwriters on, you know. So am I under the impression when you mentioned Nashville, did you literally go to Nashville? Yeah, I went to Nashville, yeah. So how did you flow, How did you get from Preston in the UK to Nashville? <laughs> Tell me the story well, about that. Yeah, I had this crazy... I was, I was actually... Um, I watched... There was a documentary on the BBC all about Nashville. And I watched it and I thought, you know, I'm not strictly country, but that seems like my kind of town. Everybody's writing songs and it's a little community and it's not too big. So I crazily then planned this trip to go on my own. I'd never really been many places before, to be honest, not been as far as America before. And uh, I just grabbed my guitar and went, and went to Nashville and I stayed in this little place in the middle of Nashville, which was like a, it was called the Scarrett Bennett Center. And it was like a little retreat where people go for like religious weekends and work conferences and stuff. So it was just really peaceful. There was no alcohol allowed on the place and everything. And uh, so I just chilled out, wrote a few songs and I went out every night to a different venue, just playing the different open mics, got a few gigs, uh, met a lot of really cool people, musicians. And um I was terrified most of the time but because I'd never really been to America and it was all new to me. But I settled into it and I started relaxing. And, uh, and yeah, I had the time of my life. I was there for about 12 or 13 weeks in the end. So, And I absolutely couldn't praise the place enough, to be honest. Fantastic. Everything how, did you manage, how did you manage the time zone difference? Well, I, was, I was tired when I got there. The, the main thing I noticed about Nashville was the heat. Like I come from a quite a cold northern town in England, and I stepped out of the airport, and it's this is nine o'clock at night, and it just like went, and I thought, am I going to be able to live with this? This is hot, hotter than I've ever known, you know, um, and it just. But I got used to it eventually, and I used to run from venue to venue to avoid her, uh, avoid the sun. It was so bloody hot. It was like hundred and two degrees one day um have you been to nashville yourself i haven't been to nashville i was supposed to go a few years ago for a um for a get together meetup where we were all going to go and sing like karaoke and sing together but something happened and i wasn't able to go but we're talking about pre-pandemic like 2016 but it didn't work out right yeah yeah but but yeah no, i couldn't say enough good things about the place and i joined this organization called the nashville songwriters association and uh, that was brilliant. It was actually on Music Row where all the labels are. And I, it was a place to practice and you could uh, submit music to publishers and uh, they had social evenings and everything. And it was just, I would love to go back and live there. You know, it was like 
it was just a mecca for music and and, and the other thing i noticed as well is it's just all music styles now whereas maybe in the past it was mainly country and there obviously is still a massive country element but they weren't worried if you weren't playing country you know they were happy for all styles to play and i thought it's becoming quite a center of music now along with uh la and london and new york i think yeah great i place. understand that i understand that now you're in preston uk now that's the town north of england between yeah. two cities manchester yeah. and liverpool um and you played at the venues such as the Blues Cat Cafe in Manchester. I know a couple of people in Manchester. I know some people in Brighton. I'm familiar right. with the place. I was in England like years ago, and I remember going to Piccadilly Circus. I remember um, yeah. just, yeah, it was, I wish I could go back to England, but um, I've been Did there. you like? I liked, yeah, I liked England back then. I don't know what it's like now, but I like england i like london i want to go to manchester and visit my friend in brighton oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and i watch a lot yeah, of Doctor Who too. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we watch <laughs> that's how i feel that's how i became familiar with it doctor who <laughs> when i was in nashville um, somebody asked me if i knew the queen <laughs> see a gen genuine question do you know really? the queen well, yeah, yeah no i not i don't know the queen <laughs> wow <laughs> that's funny yeah, so yeah, yeah you spent most of your life out on the road playing live shows across the UK including performance on the acoustic stage at Stockton Riverside Festival wow supporting yeah. Ballet Drawn Boy we know about them yeah. Um, yeah. now your song Our Town which is the uh, newest single that was released uh, can you give us an idea about your whole songwriting process how did it come to be how did you come up with that title for the song um, I usually my songwriting process is I usually start with um, a title funny enough or like a phrase or something uh, I usually think that that would be good so I just write it in a book and just forget about it for a while and just keep coming back to things you know um, that particular song um, I wanted to write a song about my hometown and I wanted to, but I didn't really want to write it so much about my hometown as, as being a backdrop to a story. So the, the song is actually really about um, a night out with a girl kind of thing and all the things that we used to do. And Preston is the backdrop to that. And I've, you know, I've put a few uh, landmarks in there so that people would, would know it's from but it's really a generic song about just just any town uh the title probably came from um it's sort of the pride of thinking you know this might not be the greatest town in the world but it's our town you know this is where we grew up this is where i was born this is everything i've ever known you know this is my football club or uh you know or american football club or baseball club this is um you know this is my town all and and you know and it says in the lyric um, it's a town like any other but this is our town you know it's just like all the others but this is our town and it's special and, and then in the last uh the last part of the song i say that no matter where you go which is like in life you can go off and especially when you're young you go and move to cities and do everything but you always know that your hometown's there if you want to come back to it at some point you know at some stage in your life you've got family and friends and you've got roots and, and that, that's really what the song's about. Yeah. The one thing about the UK is that they have more rain and less sun here. I live in Toronto and July is the most hottest, hottest week. You're saying that Nashville, like we get temperatures sometimes in July, very hot, like 90, 93. Yeah. And there's a lot of sun. And when it does rain, it's because it's, it's so hot that when it does rain, you, some people just, they stand out in the rain and they just let it, pour yeah. on it because you know it's kind of relieved the the heat right yeah, yeah if i yeah. went to the uk i would definitely have to bring my umbrella right <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. always raining yeah. well um, manchester which is where i live is notorious for rain it's 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 like a standing joke that everybody has you know it always rains we do get a lot of rain um well what makes you want to stay in the uk and not move to nashville well i want to go again yeah i want to go again next year i think the whole i did plan to go back so, sooner but as you say there's been some crazy years in the past three or four years 
with, with travel and everything else with the pandemic. So uh, that's why I decided to to get some tracks down. And now I've got them down. I mean, I'm getting some really good interest. I've been in the last month. I've been played on over fifty radio stations. So a lot of them Congratulations. have been America and Europe, and uh, got a publisher who's interested at the moment. Quite a, a major publisher. So, and they have offices in Nashville and New York and London. So that would be my dream to to obviously to to go and do that. And I would move to Nashville, like you know, the drop of a hat, if, if given any opportunity. I want to go with a lead, though, this time, instead of just going uh, and, and sort of winging it as I was. I'd like to um, I like to go with something, if you know what I mean, some kind of contact. So I'm sending lots of emails out and everything at the moment, you know, so. That's yeah, but, excellent. And you're yeah. doing that all on your own, too. Yeah, yeah, I do it all on my own, recording everything on my own, doing all the marketing and all the web stuff and the online stuff and produce it all everything yeah i don't really work with anybody i don't think no i know a, a distributor yeah that's it i know a lot of musicians that prefer to work on their own they're their own pr i know a drummer from a band and she's actually the manager as well she books the venues she does everything but she's also the yeah. drummer of the band it's a lot better than hiring somebody you don't know what they're doing they could be scammers they could be scamming money stuff like that so it's good you do things on your own because the only one that you can trust is yourself right yeah everyone, especially music everyone um carl elon's music will be um linked down below in the description um he just released his debut album last year called highway dreams and yeah. this year we have a really wonderful song here which we mentioned earlier our town there's also one called road Worn and Only the Brave. Can you give us an idea of Only the Brave, how that came to be? What's the process in that one? Did you come up with, you said, a title and a phrase and then you wrote around it? Or was that different? Because I talked to another musician and they said that they take a title. Let's say you want to take a title, it always rains in UK. And then they just write a song around that. Is that what you do? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's exactly it. Um, not always. Sometimes I have the idea for a song and then you, you're looking for the hook. You're looking for the title. Uh, with Only the Brave, the, 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 the theme in that for me was it's about brothers and friendship and growing up. And that um, I, su I suppose the metaphor in it is that it's hard to maintain friendships. It's hard to keep them lifelong. I grew up with two brothers and we, we've had our, our fallouts and fights over the years. And really only the brave will survive, only the brave, it takes work to maintain a friendship, you know, and, and, and to have a lifelong uh, bond and friendship without falling out, you know. And as you get older, I think things don't get on your nerves as much. As you get older, you become more tolerant, don't you? Um, whereas when you're younger, you seem to fall out with people and, and, you know, turn your back on people and all the rest of it. But as I've got older, I've sort of mellowed out a bit. So the song is really about um, only the brave will survive with their friendships. And so I just sort of then started um, looking back at when we were young and sort of take it through to the last verse when you say we're a bit older now. And, um, you know, and friendship is is a real important thing i don't really write about love as much as i should really i seem to i seem to look at love in terms of friendship terms if that makes sense yeah yeah i did you have, i used to write about love a lot but not so much recently you have to get along with your bandmates it's not like the police remember when Stuart copeland the drummer whenever he played on stage you'd have to make sure the symbols were facing in front of sting so he didn't have to look at them and then you have the you have Noel and Liam Gallagher from Oasis. They kind of had a falling out. Many bands yes. have a falling out, but Rolling Stones and others they seem to stay together and get along. We lost Charlie Rot Watts as well. Um, and I don't know if you ever heard of Brendan Urie from Panic at the Disco, but every time he had a band, they would always yeah. break up. So it ended up where it was just him. So he said, "Okay, I'm Panic. Just call me Panic yeah. at Disco. You want to hire yeah. my band, Panic at Disco? That's me." you know yeah yeah and we have a few others uh, you should really join our group band together um they do a lot for everyone in fact um this this friday or actually tonight um 
there's a really cool guy by the name of Grimrock. Right. And they have a music video called Haunted. And it was another band together uh, musician by the name of Lewis Tivy who actually um, filmed the video for them. And yeah. the woman in the video is his wife. And yeah, they all help each other. So Christina and her people have this called Vox and Guests. So once you respond to the questions to get in the band together, then what happens is that eventually you may be next in line to interview. I mean, that's just, she's got five or 600 people around or something, but, but they do a lot for everyone. And I see a lot of musicians, like if they go far, it's all because of them. Yeah. Um, but I'm very happy that Carl, that you have actually had your songs playing a number of radio stations in UK, across Europe, the USA, Canada, Canada and yeah. Japan, which is interesting. Yeah. So, and all these venues like the Tubular Club, the Bedford and Regal Room, it's excellent. Um, so everyone should check out his album, um, Highway Dreams, and the song World Warren. Yeah, only the brave. Uh, Digital Radiohead, American Song, Far From Home, which is a good one. And One Blood, Oh, Far From Home. What a song. Thank that you. was That's a great song. Um, yeah. Can you tell me anybody else in your family musically inclined? Or just you? Uh, not in my close family, but I, I do believe I have some relations in Australia who, um, who have like a, quite a big following. And I think um, I've also got people um, who used to play. I have a lot of... Um, relations in london who used to play around the boys in london you know in the 60s and 70s and things like that just trying to think but no not not really in my immediate family i don't really have uh it's just me just me who chose this <laughs> the crazy <Yeah>. life <laughs> well i know my father had a really good operatic voice and i asked him one day this is years ago before he died is um if you had a chance, would you become an opera singer? And he would have become an opera singer. He's got a good voice. I've inherited his voice. Right. Um, and I want to do some more performing. And I may call myself a vocalist, but I definitely want to be called a tenor because tenors have like Josh Croban, Andrea Bocelli, Matteo Bocelli. They're all tenors. And then your sopranos yeah. will be like, you know. And believe it or not, Britney Spears is a soprano. I didn't right. know that until recently. Like she's a soprano, so she could literally sing opera. Yeah. Um, so you were in all the, you have all these accolades. You were playing in all these venues. What's your favorite performance of your career? Um, I will probably go back to the Bluebird because um, it's the first time, first one of the first shows I played when I was in Nashville, and to me that was sort of the mecca place. And um, I played a song of mine, which is actually on the album called, um, uh, I can't even think of anything, uh, the start from my own song now, um, A Good Day to Be Alive. And I, you know, I was a bit nervous and everything. I played it and, and I literally got a, a standing ovation in the place. Everybody, but, you know, really appreciated the song. And, um, and it was a great moment. It, it, I thought, yeah, if I can make it in Nashville, I can make it anywhere kind of thing. So, yeah, it was a wonderful moment. I came off stage and everybody was inviting me to parties. Oh, do you want to come back to my house and we'll play guitar and all that? And I just thought, yeah, my music works here, you know, because you don't know if it's going to work in a sort of country town, uh, country city, country music city. And, um, and yeah, it really works. And I think that that was, that was a really good moment. And also, there's another band that you probably may not have heard of them called Chaz and Dave. No, the British band from the 60s and 70s, and um, and I opened for them at the Cavern, which was really good to play where the Beatles had played all them years ago, and um, that was a really good show as well. So I really enjoyed that. But I I, I like just play. I, you know, I, I'm happy to play in a massive big venue, or I'm happy to play in a little coffee bar, or anywhere. You know, anywhere it's brilliant to play a guitar and just sing your songs with people you, listening. When you go in the venue, uh, how do you test for the acoustics? Because I notice that instruments sound better when the 
place is specifically created for the acoustics? Do you yeah. go in and say, let me test this place, take your guitar and play. And if you hear like a reverb or an echo, then you say, hmm. Or do you just say, oh, you want me to play in a diner? Sure. Oh, you want me to play in a park in front of elderly people? Okay, I'll do that. So how far would you go until you say, sorry, I don't do that? Um, it's quite difficult with acoustics because venues sound a lot different when there's people in than when there's people nodding, you know, so it's, it's hard to judge. But I usually just put my faith in the sound, man. One thing, like you said, what I'm not prepared to do, I am a bit of a, a stickler. I like to insist on, on using my own equipment. So I'd rather, uh, you know, I have a certain compression an EQ and a certain microphone that I like for my vocals. And, um, and so, yeah, I think, I think taking, sometimes you can go into a venue and it sounds awful, you know, and it just, then that makes you sound awful, you know? So there's a lot of it is the equipment that you use, you know? So I like to use my own, uh, my own rack set up on the vocals particular. Yeah. So what happens if your strings of your guitar break? Do you have a backup? Um, yeah, I have a backup guitar, usually. Is it so, close by you can just grab it, or do you have to, oh, hold on one second, walk over, then get it? Um, I would say that you just grab it and carry on as fast as you can. Yeah, and somebody usually will pass you the guitar as well. Yeah, somebody, you know, one of the, your roadies or, or whatever will pass you the guitar. But guitar strings don't tend to break a lot, really, as much as you would think. Um, but I have had them break in the past. It's a bit of a nightmare, but you're just, you're just going to carry on, you know. The show must go on kind of thing. <laughs> What's your pre-show rituals? Like, I mean, I know you have to make sure that the, that the guitar is tuned. You have to make sure that you're not like... <laughs> Um, do some stretches, whatever. You, you don't just uh, walk into the venue, take your guitar and start playing. There's got to be some sort of ritual that you do to prepare for it. Um, well, I don't drink. A lot of people will have like a, a shot of whiskey or a couple of pints of beer or something. I don't like the feeling of, oh, I want to be present, if you like. Um, so I don't do that. Um, what do I do before I go on? I usually get really nervous and pace around the car park, to be honest. <laughs> that That's usually my ritual. And I also go through the words over and over. You know, I don't want to forget the words. There's a lot of words to remember. And I think, uh, you know, everybody always, that's like a, a standard question. How do you remember all them words from like 20 songs, you know? And you remember them because you keep playing them and going through them in your head and you've almost got to be, it's got to become an automatic reaction. So I think my ritual probably is going through the words, preparation, um not really relaxing to be honest i'm not one of these people who sits there and tries to relax um just pacing around the car park until the minute you have to go on and then you've just got to do it and hope it all goes well really you know but i've got better with nerves over the years i must admit i'm not as nervous as i used to be yeah so there's no song that you have played where you just wait no, that doesn't sound right did i tune this thing um <laughs> I once sang the same, I once sang the second verse, I sang the first verse again. I remember what? doing that once, which was a bit stupid. What else have I done? Um, I did the same thing, my friend. I spent two weeks learning the song. And when yeah. I finally, I sat, I stood there and I'm like, oh no. And <laughs> I had the microphone in my hand. Um and I went, and I just sang the first lyric again. And when they came up to me and said, that was Chris Kidd. Oh, you got a great voice, blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah. But, and instead of saying, thank you very much, I appreciate it. I went, yeah, but you know, I forgot the second line, blah, blah, blah. And he said, shut up, Chris. You don't have to say that. They don't know the song. You know? Right. So Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the thing is, you're singing. And you, if just for one moment you start thinking about something else, you can you lose your concentration and i used to do that a lot as well i used to come off stage and people oh you that was really good love this love that and yeah but and, and you give them all the negative stuff yeah but this went wrong that went wrong and i i've stopped doing that now because they don't even notice half the time do you know what i mean the crowd doesn't even know what you've done wrong half the time but you know but you've got to let it go you know you've got to just let it go and and take the compliments <laughs> 
Exactly, my friend. How do you deal with anxiety and your mental health? How do you take care of that? Uh, I have had mental health anxiety issues in my life, to be honest. Um, but there's a lot of it about, I say, because they've actually just set up a charity for musicians with mental health problems and um, in England. And uh, you can get all this free treatment for, for, for people with mental health issues who are particularly musicians. So. Wow. And I know Bruce Springsteen has had a lot of trouble with depression. He's been quite open about Ooh. that in, in his books and stuff like that. But um, how do I deal with anxiety? Before I go on, you mean, before I go on to play. Um, or even during your life, when you just want to sit down and just practice playing, there's got to be something that say, you know what? I can't play or I have to go for a walk. I have to do this. I have to take a drive out in the country. I walk a lot, to be honest. I do a lot of walking. Uh, that keeps me kind of relaxed. So I um, I do a lot of city walking at nights. You know, I'll go out walking through the parks. And when I was in Nashville, I walked everywhere. And oh, that wow. sort of relaxes you before the gig. I walked home from the venues. People used to say, oh, you're crazy. You need to get a taxi. Uh, but I just walked everywhere. It was all right. It was safe enough, you know, so... Yeah, I do a lot of walking, I would say. That's how I deal with the anxiety. And I drink a little bit of herbal tea as well. So chamomile tea, not herbal tea. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, is there ever a time, Carl, in your life where you just wanted to give up? Yeah, many times. Many times. Um, give up music, you mean? Not yeah. Just give up, uh, yeah. What, what was the reason behind that? Um, just not getting anywhere, I guess. In the, in the early part, you know, you, you, I used, I lived in London for six months, and you're out playing venues every night, and um, and it's very hard to penetrate to get onto the other side of the industry, if you like. You know, you send hundreds of demos off, and you invite A and R men to come down and watch you, and um, and it can sometimes get a bit, you know. Am I doing the right thing here with my life? You know, should I be doing something else? Um, but I don't think I could stop if I wanted to, you know. It, it is my life, music, it is. And that's, it's, it's, I don't know if addiction is the right word, but it, it's everything, you know. It's, it's, it would be difficult to, to, to actually give up. So you keep going and, you, and you, you know, you have a little bit of success here and a little bit there and you get enough feedback to think, yeah, I'm doing something right. I've got to keep going. And so you just keep pushing forward. And now I'm at a stage where I'm getting a little bit of success and I wouldn't give up now, you know, I'll just keep going. So yeah, there has been a few times. <laughs> I, like, I like that. Um, what is the best piece of advice another musician has ever given you? Um, best piece of advice a musician ever given me. Um, don't do music. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> the best piece of advice a musician ever gave me. I think um, somebody once told me to listen to as many songs as you can and learn as many songs as you can before you start writing your own. You know, and re really listen and, and, and learn a lot of songs and go out playing and then it just let, let it naturally come where you start writing your own material. But unless you have that solid base of, you know, 100 songs or 200 songs that you've learnt in the style that you want to, to write in, I guess. I, I think somebody once told me that, and that's what I did in the early part of my life when I was out playing open mics. You know, I was playing hundreds of songs, you know, mainly American music. And... Um, and yeah, that's that's that, that was the best advice I ever got, I think. That was from another musician who was an elderly guy who'd been doing it a while, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and, and one day you're going to be really big. People say, I want to see Carl Elan. How much are your tickets? The same in price as Taylor Swift. $9,000? Yes. You oh, hear about that girl that spent $9,000? I always keep saying this every podcast. I'm going to comment. Will you stop sharing that story about Taylor yeah. Swift? Uh, this girl who paid nine thousand dollars for a ticket to see Taylor Swift. Really ridiculous. I couldn't I couldn't live with that. If I were Taylor Swift, I'd give her her money back. 
<laughs> just couldn't live with taking nine thousand dollars off someone. Well, you're you're yes. not Taylor Swift. You're Carl Swift. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um yes so i want to talk to you about love songs um people who write love songs basically write them for their the love of their life uh i know a few people have written a song for their father yeah. um and there's a few good love songs from louis capaldi um but i'm talking about real love songs that are written for someone that you're married to or someone that your girlfriend's with or love what happens when a relationship ends? You think these songs are worth listening to? Because I wrote this song for my wife now that she's no longer my wife or my girlfriend. This song has no meaning. How do you feel about that? I think if I wrote a song for someone, I've, I've written songs that feature, <laughs> that star girls from my past, relationships from my past. Um, and I'm no longer with them. I wouldn't stop playing the song. I, I, I think that, that at the time when it was written, the meaning and the feeling of the song can last forever. That moment that you capture in that song. And if people can identify with that, then I'm not going to scrap the song because I'm not with that person anymore. However, it would. It, there are songs I've written that remind me of them. So you're almost keeping the... Uh, the hurt part of you alive by keep singing it, if you know what I mean. But wow. if the song's doing well, then you can't turn your back on the song. <laughs> you know what I mean? You've got to. And I think also that if you felt a particular way at a particular point in time, you you know that's part of your story and it's part of your life. You want to keep it with you. Um, and then there's bad relationships, I guess, that you want to forget. But I don't. I don't think I've written songs about that, bad relationships. So, yeah, so I guess that's how I feel about that. But, yeah, I'm thinking because with a love song, if I wrote a love song about someone I loved, a relationship, and I'm no longer in that relationship, would it be fair for me? And maybe you can answer. Because the answer you gave me there was the best answer I've received. Um, that, oh, <laughs> that the song Amanda, for instance, if you're, it's no longer Amanda, now you can put anybody's name in there. Does that mean that the meaning of the song disintegrates? Yeah, I would say it does. I say you've got to stick to the authentic way it was yeah. written. You've got to, for, for all its, you know, problems or problems, you've got to stick with, with, I mean, there's, there's also the saying in the the names have been changed to protect the innocent. There's a bit of that. Um, but if the person's not bothered, you know, I, I, it's funny you should ask this question because I had a song recently and I won't say the name of the person, um, but I changed the name. So I've just contradicted myself completely. I didn't stick with the name um, because I know that she would know and she's, you know, with someone else. Um, that it's about her and I didn't want to cause any problems. So I changed mm -hmm. it to protect the innocent, if you like. Um, so yeah, I've just contradicted myself completely there, but yeah, I suppose if, I shouldn't have changed the name really and kept it authentic. But I, I think when there's people involved who know you, who you are, you know what I mean? Um, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> Well, I think that if, if I had a relationship and I, I was a singer songwriter, well, I'm a singer, but not a songwriter. I haven't, haven't well, I actually, ha I did write four songs. That's right. I did write four songs. So, so right. this, I don't know if, were you old enough to know what these are? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I love tapes. So, this is a TDA, TDK tape in a, in a, one of these, um, one of these production studios, portable production studios from like, early 80s and yeah. you can only record on one side of these tapes right yeah well i wrote a song called i want to be free which is yeah. about a woman and i had a relationship with her and i i don't want to be with her anymore but then i wrote another song called i wanted her so it's sort of like you either want to be free from her or you want her <laughs> yeah. so i wrote another song called must say goodbye <laughs> right. and um but i wrote them with a friend of mine named bill uh, and this is one of the oldest. We have a place called 
Kmart like way back in the seventies. And this is like a $2 tape. And yeah. so this is just acoustic and I, I would record them, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't call them. I want to be free. I would say I want to be free, but I would actually change lyrics to reflect something, not someone. Yeah. And I wanted her, um, maybe change that wanted to the word need. So I needed her. And yeah. when I say goodbye, um, I would totally change it or rewrite yeah. the lyrics, but yeah. um, I would probably want to release these, but I need like a whole set. Like, I don't know how anything about that. Um, so Carl, uh, so you're playing in a venue, your favorite venue, whether it's in, let's say you in Brighton, or maybe they asked you back to Nashville or they said, we have a venue in Boston. We want you to be at, what would you do to invigorate your audience so they don't look tired or bored during your performance? What would you do? Um, people like to know where the songs come from. And I think you don't want to, you know, start, you know, reading a book out. But if you can tell them a little bit about what what influenced the song, what's it about, I think that that can sometimes shed light onto a song and make people listen to the words a bit more and a bit more interested in the song um it depends what kind of production you have as well if you've got you know a big budget and a big production there's a lot of things that bands do now isn't they on stage with big screens and singing in the middle of the stage i always like that where they go to and just do a little acoustic spot you know and a, a you two are quite in, into doing that where they They'll break it down in the middle, um, and and if you look at Coldplay, they they have a lot of interaction now at the gigs. They, they have all these different lights that the audience members are given, and they do all this. They light up all the stadium, and there's all there's all sorts of things you can do. I think the days of just playing a, a gig are, are turning into something else. You know, although Springsteen just plays his set, and you know, but for me, he's that good. He can he doesn't need gimmicks if you know what i mean he just does it you know yeah but uh, yeah i'm a big springsteen fan do you like him at all no yeah we actually love springsteen down here we've been listening to him since the 70s and uh there we actually had one of the members of his bands on our program his name is richie labamba rosenberg and he oh, also right. he also played with bon jovi's band as well so yeah. he was able to give me a little bit of insight. Oh, yeah. I mean, if we'll have anybody from a band. And so yeah. tell us a little bit, what is it like to, um, um, let's say, drummer for Aerosmith or something? What was it like to sing, be with, like, play in, uh, in Steve Tyler's band or stuff like that? You know, um, but if, if let's say, OK, we'll take Aerosmith. You've heard of Aerosmith, right? What if? Yeah. Carl, we uh, we love the fact that you have this really cool album called Highway Dreams, and we love listening to it. Um, and that was a manager for U2 or the manager for Bon Jovi's band, and they want you to open for them. What would be going through your head? I will, no matter what, no matter what it takes, I'm doing it. <laughs> so I accept yeah. it. That's what I say in show business. So I always accept it. And work out the details later, you know. If you're an actor and they say, Can you ride horses? You say, Oh, yeah, of course I can. And then you'll learn learn dead quick. You know, so what I would do is then I would I don't currently have a band to be honest at the moment. So what I would current what I would do straight away is recruit a band, you know, which I would probably audition, uh, you know, rent a place out and audition for a day and audition the different band members. I know specifically what I want from my band. Uh, my eventual band and so that I would I would make it happen I would recruit a band accept it straight away and uh, and do it because opportunities do not come that often in life and you've got to take them you know you've got to take them even if you're a bit nervous about taking it you've just got to do it work it work the details out later so yeah I would I would bite the hand off as they say yeah. So don't say no to opportunities because you never know when they're going to come again. Yeah, if ever. You know, I I, I once got um, a gig. I got offered a gig opening for um, like three different acts from the 60s. 
So there was trogs. Remember the trogs? Oh, wow. Really? Animals. I no way. Remember. Yeah. And I was the opening act. And then they were all going to play. And I had a really bad cough. Couldn't sing at all. Literally, every time I sang. And it, and it, I, and I let them down. And I, I, what I did, I held off because I thought, I'm not going to ring the promoter and say I can't do it. I'll get rid of wow. the cough. And it never went. And I tried everything. You know, I was trying trying witchcraft in the end to get rid of it. You know, I tried everything and uh, couldn't get rid of it. So I rang him up on the day and my sister rang and said he can't play. And the guy said, well, it's terrible that you let me down on the day. You never give me another shot. And to this day, I'm thinking, I'm thinking shit, I could have opened for the animals. And, um, you know, but that was that that wasn't so much a missed opportunity as ill health you know i couldn't do it but yeah so you don't want to miss opportunities when they come along you know you've got to do it no matter what but i couldn't sing that night i could just couldn't do us coughing you know yeah but yeah so yeah i think you've got to take everything that's offered to you because it, it doesn't come again very often no <laughs> you definitely want to um you don't want to say no to this is there a genre that you won't play or were you just okay rap yeah, let's do it. Oh, classical? Yeah, let's do it. Who? Chopin? Mozart? Yeah, let's do it. Or are you like, oh no, 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 Rob. I'm I'm uh I don't play stuff like that. <laughs> What's your attitude yeah, well, towards that? My attitude towards that is I'm sort of talking to a publisher at the moment and there's nothing concrete, but they're interested and they're they're having to listen to my stuff. Now, if I get on with this publisher, part of the job if you like will be writing for other people so they help you they help you get a publishers i know you probably know this but they're different than a label in that they help get your music onto tv and film and advertisements and they also expect you to do you know write for the younger bands the younger artists and that so if i was thinking about this just today actually if the guy said to me with the exception of rap because i couldn't um I wouldn't claim, I think rap comes with the territory of where you're from and the experience that you're living through. And I couldn't do that. I wouldn't want to do that to rap music. But any other genre, if I was asked to write it by the publisher, um, which is one of the things I'm going to say to them, actually, if they turn me down, give me a typical job spec of, of writing a song and I will write for you a song. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I would pretty much do any genre with the exception of rap, and that there's nothing against rap. It's just that it's the most authentic, probably one of the most authentic music forms. You have to be from that area, or 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 you have to have experienced that. I would say maybe not everyone would agree with that, but you know what I mean. I would say so. I think but Eminem. You make really live them songs yeah yeah you know, public enemy and stuff they really sang about what they lived you know so i have well, lived that, so. if you had to do a cover song of an m&m m &M song what one would it be stan Dan. Just the but you need a girl for the uh for the dido yeah, part dido is my favorite artist yeah yeah you'd have to I, get if you, if you really want a cover version of stan you will have to do everything you can. You said you'd do anything you can just to, you know, do opportunities. Yeah. If you really wanted to cover Stan, you need a girl in that part. So you, who would you get? Do you have one in mind? Well, I would sing the rap, actually. I would try and sing the rap. Rob, you know, he's talking, Eminem's talking parts, the letter and everything that the guy's writing to him. I would probably try and sing them parts. And um, who do I like? I like Jewel, actually. Have you heard of Jewel? Yeah. Yeah, I, I love her voice. And I like a lot of the 80s uh, female singers as well, like uh, Belinda Carlisle and uh, mm. Susan. Yeah, from the Goggles, yeah. Wangles. Um, so I like uh, distinctive voices. I like, um, oh, I can't think of her name now, the Fleetwood Mac um, sang with Tom Petty. Stevie Nicks. Stevie Nicks. I like her voice as well. Yeah, there's but a yeah. lot of weird duets out there, like Britney Spears and Elton John, the song yeah. Hold Me Close. I mean, like... I yeah, think yeah. I I know people love this Christmas tune, but it's uh, called um, 
Uh, little drummer boy with David Bowie and Bing Crosby. I, I don't like that duet. Like, why are you putting two totally different people together? And people are going to hate me. They're going to send me comments and say, honey, I love that song. But uh, I did a cover version of Britney Spears' I Don't Want to Be the Last to Know. And yeah. another one is called Every Time, which is my favorite. I did a cover version of that one. With, with like, I heard an AI version of a Johnny Cash cover of Aqua's Barbie Girl. Oh, kind of yeah, weird. yeah. Kind of weird. Yeah, I saw that knocking around. How was that? I never heard it, actually. Um, what do you think of AI? What do you think of using artificial intelligence to like, there's like AIs where you can just take a cover song and say, I want the Elton John song, um, whatever, sung by David Bowie. And yeah. it, it'll clone his voice. And you hear um, Benny and the Jets by David Bowie. What do you think of that? Um, I, I was reading an article the other day about uh, McCartney's actually sample John Lennon's voice and they're putting a song out. To, I think it's either coming out or it's just come out um, where they're going to do that. Was well, that the one well, by Paul McCartney mentioned that that actually people yeah. saying, is that one of the Beatles songs that were in the volume? She said, no, he admitted that they yeah. used an AI to clone John Lennon's voice. Yeah. Yeah. It was a song that people John just had, don't like it. It was a song that John had written, but he hadn't quite finished. I think he just recorded it into a tape recorder. Uh, just in, in his apartment, and I think they've made it into a proper production. Yeah, I don't think you're ever going to be able to replace the human factor of of voices. I think a lot of character in 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 voices comes from the inaccuracies, if you like. And AI are, are like perfectly auto tuned, if you like. Um, I'm not sure what I think about it. I remember a few years ago they had these. Uh, these AI sort of concerts where they were simulations on stage and you could go and see Elvis. Like Michael or Jackson one? Yeah. Michael Jackson's and things. I mean, a little bit creepy maybe. I don't know. I mean, I often think about the artist who, who's not here anymore. Would he agree to it? <laughs> if you know what I mean? He doesn't really have a say in whether he wants them to do it, you know. Well, I know that after 40 years, ABBA decided to do another concert, but what they did is they not only came up with the album Voyage, uh, so what they did is they had entire holograms made of themselves that what they looked like in the 70s. So you had Benny Anderson, you had Bjorn Orvaeus, you had Frida, um, and then you had uh, Agnetha Falskog, the whole members of ABBA, and they sat in the back while their younger yeah. versions were playing on stage. And I'm like, that's kind of weird because I don't want to go to a Rolling Stones concert with an 80 year old playing around and dancing around at 80 years old on stage and them using a hologram version of Charlie Watts. Yeah. You either, if you can't replace Charlie Watts, then, you know, but it's, I don't know, AI is going to get to a point where you don't know who's real and who isn't. Oh, I just saw. A concert mm -hmm. with Britney Spears. No, that wasn't her. She's not. Yeah. She's not touring anymore. Mm -hmm. And it, it's going to get out of hand. And you know, I think mm -hmm. it's getting crazy. Do, yeah. you, like, so you don't I, want me. We don't want me to take your voice and do a duet with you and release a song. You're going to want to wait a minute, Carl Elan. I never. I never. Blah blah blah. You would expect yeah. to be paid. You expect to get your paycheck on that litigation, mm -hmm. maybe, right? Yeah. It's fascinating that they can even do it, you know, that the technology yeah, is it's crazy. Yeah, I always think, is this the point of, you know, like the Terminator films where this is how it began and then in 50 years' time, you know what I mean? Exactly. When the machines take over, it's like that's how it all started, you know. And it's in everything. It's not just music, is it? It's, I mean, it's now in everything. And it's just happened overnight, you know. It's like, it's. I mean, I produce, I use a little bit of it in producing, so I struggle a little bit with EQ when I'm mixing and there's an, you know, and you can spend hours with an EQ, um, you know, so that you can hear all the frequencies of all the different instruments and AI, you'll click a button and it'll literally just do it for you based on, um, you know, a thousand top producers and what they would do, you know, and it's, it's, well, it's crazy, isn't it really what's happening? One well, of the faces, using... the deep fakes as well, like the Tom Cruise deep fake. You know, it's not really Tom Cruise, but it looks like Tom Cruise. 
yeah, it's, yeah. it's evil because they can use it for evil and say, look, you were in this video. You were part of it. Let's arrest you. And they say, well, I wasn't there. They just took my face and put it on this guy. You know, it's yeah, dangerous. Yeah, yeah. It can be dangerous. Yeah. Um, so, my friend, what accomplishments do you see yourself achieving in the next five years? Um, I would I would love to build a bigger fan base. Um, that would be one ac accomplishment. Um, I've started, you know, in the last few months, I've picked up a bit of pace. And like I said, I'm getting played on 50 radio stations. And I want to I wanna get, you know, a big listenership now on Spotify and Apple if I can. Um, I'd love to get a publishing deal, like I was saying before, and just work more in the industry, writing for other people and, and working on my own material uh, alongside that. I'd like to go back to Nashville um, and spend some, some proper time there and uh, play some of the venues there and, and get involved in, in the industry there as well, you know, with some publishers and things like that, and maybe write for some other people. I'm happy to do that. And um, and just be happy, really. Just just be happy uh, in myself and in music, and uh, and start enjoying life a bit more than be stressed out about music all the time. You know, just just let it do the best you can, and then just let it happen. If you know what I mean, see what happens. So yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, you need that. Like we were talking about you going for walks a lot, especially in Nashville. Besides music. Uh, what other things do you like to do besides um, walking? And do you have any other interests outside of music? Yeah, I like film. I watch a lot of film. Um, outside music, I watch, uh, I watch sport. Watch quite a lot of sport, uh, football or soccer, as you call it. Uh, you call it soccer in Canada, you do, don't you? Yeah. Um, we call so, it yeah. soccer in Canada, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was actually called soccer to begin with, you know. Everybody always well, thinks you, soccer is an American. Your soccer's, name, yeah, soccer. it's football, but yours yeah. is soccer. So when yeah, people well, say in England or in Ireland or Scotland, soccer, it's actually football because here it's called football. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I watch a lot of sport. Um, I socialize a bit as well. I spend time with my brothers. And um, I do a lot of walking, and I like I like uh, cinema and film, really. Yeah, but I try to. I've, I'm trying to not do music as much, you know. I'm trying to do other things, but it's quite difficult when you, you know, when you love it so much. You've got to find time to say, uh, you know, it's, it's seven o'clock at night now. I've got to stop, you know, and go and watch TV for a bit and just chill out, you know. It's hard to switch off as well. What's your favorite movie, Carl? Is it all have to do with music? Like um, music and lyrics is a good one with Drew Barrymore. Or that's a good Which... film. Um, I actually love. This might sound a bit crazy, but I actually love like Stallone films. Like I was a big fan of the Rocky movies growing up. Uh, absolutely loved them. Um, I like uh, mafia films, gangster films, like uh, you know Scorsese stuff and. Uh, De Niro and Joe Pesci and all that, Goodfellas and all that kind of films. I used to love Sopranos when it was on TV. That was mm. my favorite. That was the ultimate show. That. Um, what are, what other movies do I like? Yeah, James Gandolfini was quite the had quite the mom, mobster look. No, oh, I did. It was such a shame when he he yeah, yeah heart attack, so he? young. Yeah, he went on holiday, didn't he, to see his son or something, and just had a heart attack. It was so yeah. sad, that, but. Yeah, I've watched that. I've watched the box set of that two or three times. I love that. Um, but yeah, so yeah, they're, they're the kind of stuff I like, really. So yeah, I like action films, I would say, mainly. But they're quite good film and TV because you can get ideas for songs from them as well, you know. You can get titles or, you know, you can tell people if you like a character story, you want to tell that story in a song, you know. That's well, every year, like. every year we have the Toronto International Film Festival. Um, and they had the Sylvester Stallone, uh, I guess it was Sylvester Stallone room where they had all his artwork right. and they had the very first Rocky script. It was, I couldn't believe it was that thick, yeah. the Rocky script, because apparently I think he wrote it, s signed by him under glass. Yeah, yeah. And all his 
little quotes and paintings. I I, I didn't realize he was quite a yeah quite yeah. an artist. He's pretty good. Well, when he wrote Rocker, they they said we'll do it, the film company, but you can't be in it. And he said, no, no, I've got to be in it. It's got to be me. So he went away for, I think it was a year or so, and he kept pestering him, and eventually they said, okay, then you can be in it. So that, that's what he He made it happen kind of thing, which was always quite a cool story. Yeah. Such a great concept, you know, to be the first Rocky particularly, you know, the underdog who gets a shot at the titles. Very romantic, very brilliant story, I thought. Yeah. Quite amazing. Do you have any weaknesses that you're actively working to improve on, Carl? Um, yeah, pro probably working too hard and, and trying to find, like I said before, trying to find the time to switch off and not be so focused on, on mm -hmm. one particular pursuit. Yeah, I would say that, that that's my way. And, and being a perfectionist as well is another thing. I've got better at that over the years. I've realized that like when you're singing a vocal, for example, it's not, I read this quote that it, it, it's it's an average of all your best takes. And that's all you're ever going to get. You're never going to do the best vocal you can do on a song. So you've just got to do an average of, of all, you know, of all the best takes you can do. And I've got better at letting that go now, you know, thinking, well, it's not perfect, but it's got character. So, you know, feeling sometimes and emotion is more important than, than being some perfect vocal take. You know, you don't want to be like AI. <laughs> Too perfect. You know, so. How do I know you're not an AI and Carl Elan is currently dealing with a, a sick stomach or something? Can you prove that you're actually not E? <laughs> no, probably not. No. <laughs> okay, what's 225,972 times 72.5? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm not an AI. <laughs> well everyone um carl's first album highway dreams is linked below it's on spotify and all major platforms it's got songs like ride it my way Digi digital Re radio land brothers beneath and the days of me and you so it's a good album it's got quite actually 24 songs that's unnatural for an album yeah to have more than 12 songs on it what happened there it's it's sort of like a double album, really, that just just kept adding tracks to the playlist, if you like. Um, so I just kept adding them, and uh, I think that, that that's it, though. Now that you know, that's where it ends on on twenty four. So it's quite. It's, it would be in the old days a double album, if you like. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of material on there. Yeah, lots, lot, you know, lots of fast rocking songs and lots of forky storytelling stuff as well. So it's a nice mixture of everything, really. Well, this is excellent, Carl. Really appreciate this interview, the opportunity to talk to you and learn all about yeah. you and all your music and everything. We'll link down below with all the uh, social media, everything that you know we love, like the Spotify, the Amazon Music, the YouTube, the Facebook, the. Well, it's not called Twitter anymore. It's called X. Oh, I hope he changes it back. And Instagram. So you can find Carl on there. So, Carl, we're going to end the stream. Now, before we go, can you give us words of advice for the audience? Words of advice to the audience. Music advice or general advice? or Let's give anything. music advice. Music advice. I'm going to repeat what I said earlier, which is if you want to be successful in music, I would start by learning as many songs as you can by the artists that you love. And eventually you can, you know, gleam a bit of their magic and uh, start writing your own material. That would be my advice. Yeah. And get out playing as well. Get out playing the material, you know, straight away. No matter how bad or good you are, just get out there and, and, and you, you only get better by doing it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And also, anybody out there that wants to buy my... Just kidding. <laughs> um, Carl Eland, everyone, from Preston in the UK. And we're going to say goodbye. Cheers, Chris. I really enjoyed that. It was brilliant. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Brilliant. Cheers, mate.